shortly. Thank you so much for being here. It's a packed house tonight. Hello, hello. Okay. I think we'll go ahead and get started. We have an exciting talk tonight. Welcome to our membership meeting and speaker series. My name is Nicole Netherton. I'm the executive director of Travis Audubon. And we are very glad to see you this week. I hope you and your families are recovering from the ice and its effects, and we're very grateful that we were able to reschedule for this week. If you are a member, thank you so much for your continued support. If you're not a member, please join us. You can go to the membership page on our website, travisaudubon.org. A couple of housekeeping things. If you could please be sure that your microphone is muted, and if you can close your camera during the, the talk, that helps uh, us limit bandwidth and minimize distractions for everyone. We thank you in advance. And even though you'll be muted, if you have questions, you can enter them in the chat and we'll include them at our Q&A session at the end. We're also recording this meeting and we'll share it on our social media channels after we're finished. I wanted to share an important announcement before we get started. The board of directors of Travis Audubon has chosen to honor Greg Lasley with our 12th annual Victor Emanuel Conservation Award. As many of you know, Greg passed away in January, but his wife, Cheryl, was able to share the news with him before he died. Okay. We're planning a virtual event that will take place on October 8th, 2021. And we're actually sending out a save the date email announcement tomorrow. So keep your eye out for that. We're very sad that Greg will not be with us, but we're so happy to honor such a worthy individual with this award. So now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Kaylee Zazula, who will tell you some more about some more exciting events that we have coming up. Hello, Kaylee. Hi, everyone. Before we get started with Julia's presentation, I'd like to make a couple announcements about upcoming Travis Audubon events. Vernathon is happening this year, starting April 1st, with registration opening on Monday. Due to the pandemic, Bernathon will look a little different this year. We won't have the destination trips that usually occur, but we encourage everyone to register your own team. You can compete on a team individually in a dispersed flock, which we have more information about that on our website, or with members of your household. You can find more information at travisaudubon.org slash Bernathon. We will be kicking off Birdathon this year with our second annual birding brawl, which you may remember from spring of last year. Four skilled birders in the Travis Audubon community will be competing in a big day on April 3rd. And we encourage you to show your support for the competitors by donating to their fundraising pages. More information will be coming very soon about who this year's competitors are. So stay tuned for those updates. We also have a very special merchandise drop for Birdathon coming soon. So as you can see, there's a lot to look forward to and many ways to support Travis Audubon despite being unable to physically be together. Travis Audubon will be turning 69 years old on March 15th and we will be celebrating our birthday with Golden Cheek Week. During that week, we will enjoy a documentary celebrating early conservation efforts in Austin talk to leaders in golden cheek warbler research, both at home and abroad, and learn about the history of the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve, a crucial golden cheek breeding ground. Check out the calendar on our website to register for these events. As we approach spring, we will also begin promoting Lights Out Texas efforts, which involves turning out non-essential lights during nights projected to have heavy migration in our area to ensure, ensure smoother migration for birds. In addition to these calls for action, we will be coordinating volunteer efforts to monitor bird building collisions. We will send more information on how to volunteer once it is available, but if you want to be added to the list of volunteers for this project, please email volunteer at travisaudubon.org. Now I will turn it over to Jane Tillman, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you, Kaylee. Well, hi, everyone. We're really fortunate to have Dr. Julia Clark from UT Austin back tonight. I think we had her about seven years ago when we were meeting over at Hyde Park United Methodist Church. And she's back to talk about something similar, but also different. 
which has to do with dinosaurs and um, the evolution of traits that we think of as distinctly avian. With uh, in this, um, well, let me just tell you a little bit more about Dr. Clark. She's the a professor in vertebrate paleontology at the Jackson School of Geosciences. And she is very interested in how new structures and functions arise in deep time, which itself is just such a neat concept, deep time, with a focus on the evolution of dinosaurs, including birds. Recently, her work has focused on unraveling the origin and evolution of the of the syrinx in birds, the avian vocal organ, which I think is pretty cool. Her lab's research work has taken them to such diverse places as Antarctica, Peru, Chile, Mongolia, China, and New Zealand. And I will tell you that she's not that fond of the cold. And I would say probably none of us are at this point. <laughs> um, her research has been funded by the National Science Foundation, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, National Geographic Society, Explorers Club. That's That all sounds so, you know, neat 1900s, 1800s, you know, that kind of thing. She's Her work has been covered by NPR Science Friday, New York Times, Washington Post, National Geographic. Most importantly, I think for us is she is actually a fellow of the American Ornithological Society. And to me, that's pretty impressive. And she received her degrees from Brown University and Yale University. I think we're in for a really dynamic presentation tonight. So please welcome Dr. Julia Clark. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. It's such a pleasure to be here and have all of you guys turn out after such a difficult time in Austin. Um, so I hope you're all now warm and have uh, a, a, a good water supply around. This is not a, a joking matter, but um, yeah, I, I, I did have some Antarctica flashbacks um, when I saw the cold that Austin was going through um, last week. So normally I am in Austin. Right now I'm in California, <clears throat> but um, I, I normally am with you guys. So it's a little weird to look at myself giving a talk. I can't see all of your lovely faces, but I'm going to pretend you're all, I can see you all. And I hope you'll all enter questions into the Q&A for after the talk. So that was a fabulous introduction. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit kind of where I come from and where birds fit into my research just to open. And it kind of connects with the notion of discovery. So we have this kind of notion of discovery that it takes place in the field in one moment. But in fact, for me, the most exciting discoveries that I've made kind of, they weren't in one place or in one moment per se, it was putting pieces together. So this is Antarctica and Southern Chile where I've been working most recently in Peru. Um, but what we, what we do is take kind of simultaneously new fossils that are not simultaneously, but we take fossils that are new discoveries, but we also richly kind of bring to that context new data on living organisms. So I'm very much an evolutionary biologist. Um, what you see in the screen right now, and I'm just gonna check my internet connection, is some of the projects we've worked on. So deciphering why different groups of birds have different um, uh, feathering, so covert feathering. Um, those are the shorter feathers on the wings. You guys probably all know that. And then also, sorry, I just wanted to make sure because my internet was unstable. We've looked at brains. We look at, um, rend you can take a bird skull and you can, can look inside that skull and see the shape of the brain recorded. You can also do that in fossils. And the spinning thing at the bottom that gets prime uh, uh, this uh, pride of place is um, of what we call a it's a re, it's an image of a vocal organ that is where the sound is produced in birds and uh, in this special or organ called the syrinx which is a true evolutionary novelty and that's been a lot of my more recent work although I've also worked on the evolution of feather colors feather shape um, that's illustrated in some other pictures on 
the uh, on the slide, and I'm happy to answer any questions on those. My research, and I think research in general, um, the best research is enabled by diverse minds, and I'm lucky to have a great team uh, of students, postdoctoral fellows that are even functioning still in Zoom world where we work kind of like basically remotely um, to try to continue uh, unraveling questions of these, the evolution of new structures and behaviors. So that's really important for me to emphasize that, that the study of birds and the study of evolutionary innovation and paleontology is really a field that, um, that you can start at any point with an interest in geoscience or bioscience. And you can also follow our lab, the lab members tweet uh, from my, my Twitter feed, which is Julia Clark Paleo Lab on Twitter. So you can also see some of them tweeting out um, their stories and research. So uh, I always forget to, to mention that, but that's also true. So today I'm going to give this talk, I call the Secret Lives of Dinosaurs. And if you happen to see a version of this talk that I gave um, for Hot Science Cool Talks, this is a new improved version where we've published some more papers and kind of focus on the evolution of the sound maker behind bird song. So that's one portion of today's talk. So why do I call it the secret lives of dinosaurs? Well, as long as we've known about dinosaurs, we've brought them to life in our imagination. This is one of the first illustrations of a dinosaur. Uh, and we imagined ourselves, we put ourselves in that world interacting with them and imagined what it would lo look like. And more recently, not much more recently, we, we again imagined kind of what it would be like to interact with extinct dinosaurs. So we could go on, how did they feed? What was their inter, inner artistic lives? You know, we have brought, thought of all of these things perhaps with respect to extinct animals of all kinds, but maybe in particular dinosaurs. So what I'm gonna do today is talk about how we use science to reveal what we know about dinosaur appearance and behavior and how those may give appearance and other attributes of dinosaurs would give insight into how they lived and what, uh, what uh, their ecology would have been like. So I'm gonna start with the kind of fundamentals behind the science that we do and its underpinnings are evolution at its most fundamental. So what we do is to look at um, all of the bumps and tubercles and the, the structures that are preserved readily in the fossil record. Most of those structures are preserved in, the bo in bones, bony elements. And for over 150 years, we've reconstructed the history of um, these groups using these preservable bony features. And this evidence from many kinds of, of extinct dinosaur skeletons has given us a firm insight into where they're located with respect to living animals. But another important part of my research is enabled by a different kind of investigation as shown here by this other Julia, which is taking apart uh, living animals. So this is uh, chickens, but you know, if uh, deceased animals, naturally deceased animals, form a big part of what we look at because we look at the anatomy, we look at the insides that you guys as um, living dinosaur uh, enthusiasts see from the outside, we tend to look inside. So dissection takes a big role in what we do. So I'm gonna to give, today I'm gonna to talk about several themes and I'm gonna start with themes of uh, external appearance but then I'm going to focus on what we know about extinct dinosaur sound making and how that relates to what we're learning about living bird sound making. So let's start with some things you may know a uh, little more about. So how can we tell what extinct dinosaurs looked like? Well, the key I'm going to come back to is evolution. Very close to Darwin's birthday, in fact. So when we first started envisioning dinosaurs we envisioned them like this and if i were to ask you what this um, illustration looks like i think you'd say something like this in fact this is a tuatara 
and tuataras are most closely related to all living lizards and snakes. But dinosaurs are located in a very different part of the tree. So extinct dinosaurs are nested in one group of reptiles that is called Archosauria, and the closest cousins of dinosaurs are crocodilians and birds are living dinosaurs. Well, of course, these guys look very different, right? We have um, the, this picture I took of a toucan right after it had munched on some fruit, and this picture I took of these um, large guys in, in Costa Rica. They look quite different, scaly, maybe more close, closely related to our dinosaurs of our imagination. Well, we've been lucky that since 1996, which is now a long time ago, we've been recovering um, new records of extinct dinosaurs from lake deposits. And these lake deposits were, these lakes were, were, were very rapidly deepening and there was a lot of volcanic input into these lakes. And so they've preserved in kind of fine details a lot of the external structures of extinct dinosaurs. And it really has been a revolution in our understanding of dinosaur body coverings. So this is the first feathered, the so-called so feathered dinosaur, it really is a fuzzy dinosaur found in 1996. And what it has is filaments on the tail and on the body. This is a small animal, so not all extinct dinosaurs are large. This animal is about the size of a chicken. Um, it's in about this, this, this individual. <clears throat> but we now have many, many dinosaurs that show bristles and filament-like structures. So these are all over the body. They're sometimes thick, as I said, more bristle-like and sometimes thin. Um, scales are actually relatively rare in the fossil record of dinosaurs, but characterize certain groups. In the dinosaurs that we identify based on their bony characteristics as more closely related to living birds, we found a uh, branched feather. So what I, would, what I would describe as a feather as opposed to a filament. And these are branch structures that you would recognize if one was, you know, on the, um, you would say that belongs to, uh, to a bird. Um, so these are structures that are uh, have a central rachis and barbs. And what's what interesting is that these small dinosaurs, that, like the one that I've shown on the screen, relatives of that that look quite similar, were identified based on their bony characteristics as most closely related to birds before these new fossils were found that also show pinnate feathers. So it's a nice consilience of evidence that these guys are uh, close cousins of our living birds. So if we kind of summarize what we now know, it's a really transformed understanding of dinosaur body coverings. So in the blue, I've shown evidence of um, filaments or uh, bristles. And in the yellow, I've shown dinosaurs that show evidence of branched feathers. And in fact, there's actually a bunch of other cool data I could talk about with respect to the genes that underpin feather development in living birds, which are known to be very, very early arising and um, present in all of the, in, in both crocodilians and birds. So those genes are deployed in different ways in, that, in these groups. Um, of course, there are some groups that are novel within uh, birds as well. All right, so other things that we've learned from these fossils. This is the same, this is a reconstruction of the fossil that I just showed you of Microraptor. And although I'm not going to focus on it in, in today's talk, we've made major breakthroughs with respect to reconstructing the coloration patterns of extinct dinosaurs. Um, this fossil that I worked on um, was the first extinct dinosaur, <clears throat> non-bird dinosaur, that was uh, found to have evidence of iridescent plumage. And the form of iridescence that it has um, is actually that sim is similar to that seen in ducks and in, in, in galliforms, um, among others. And what this, the interest in making sense of this fossil dinosaur led us to do was to find something new out about living birds. So in fact, we found that uniquely a long skinny pigment packages containing melanin are associated with iridescent arrays. That's the shiny colors that you see below. 
In fact, that had never been quantitatively demonstrated for living birds, but we had to do that in order to make sense of the evidence in the fossil. So you can see in blue the picture of duck melanosomes. These are those pigment packages that are really long and skinny. And the stacking of those packages affects whether the, the iridescence is more red tone or uh, green or blue tone. And what we, we can't tell the exact stacking in the fossil, but we can tell there are these long skinny melanosomes that are associated with making these iridescent colors. Similarly, a couple years later, we did looked at this fossil, which you can see in the lower left hand corner, kind of hard to see in that picture, but it has a skull very, you know, superficially similar to a velociraptor, but is covered with long feathers. And what we found in the feathers around the neck of this dinosaur was evidence of flattened plate like melanosomes. These are more similar to those that we see in swifts. So these are pigment packages, they contain melanin. And they have different shapes in birds. So small round ones tend to be associated with reddish brown color and long ones tend to be associated with black color. And these platelet like ones that are kind of like pancakes, those are associated with another form of iridescence that we see in living birds. And in fact, the shape of those packages was most similar to those seen in, in things like hummingbirds. But hummingbirds have an added novelty that you can take home to your to seeing hummingbirds as they come out uh, around your house now, which is that they have um, kind of like Rice Krispie treat uh, melanosomes that can create very bright iridescent colors. So while this dinosaur has the shape that's associated with these iridescent colors, living hummingbirds have an added novelty, as do some other groups of birds, that um, they have hollow uh, melanosomes. You can see that down in the central picture here. So some people who are really into dinosaurs and not living dinosaurs or birds found this to be a big bummer. They still want to have the Jurassic World movies with, with the traditional kind of 19th century dinosaurs. But in fact, I think it's exciting. We've now got a vision of dinosaurs that is, is very different, that there are diverse body coverings and filaments and colored feathers, et cetera, that are present in these taxa. And this is, a, I love this illustration because I think it captures the beauty of some of these incredible animals because we now have um, very large bodied tyrannosaurids. This is U. tyrannus. It's got <coughs> evidence of filaments on it. So, in uh, there it's shown for scale. Um, so this is another reconstruction of our microraptor showing the iridescence that we reconstruct. Again, we don't know the exact tonality of this iridescence, but this is a very different vision of extinct dinosaurs. And th these kinds of reconstructions are only enabled by an understanding of living birds and how living birds pigment and color their feathers. And so working to try to make sense of fossils has led us to new discoveries about living, living birds as well. What we do know about extinct dinosaurs, what do we know about their secret lives? Well, we know that iridescence is, is associated with signaling or just a visual communication in living birds. And so we can say that these early feathers that are present were not just used in potential locomotor or like functions like flight or a, a similar behavior or related behavior, but also used in communication which is a pretty big insight relative to our older visions of dinosaurs as kind of as uh, uh, stumpy lizard animals. So in terms of evolutionary innovation and the stuff that I find really cool is that if you look at this picture and I realize it's a little complicated, we won't spend much time on it, but if you look down here where it says bipedalism, higher metabolic rates, respiratory shifts, those are things that we know took place in close to the ancestor of li living crocodilians and birds. And you might be surprised and say, wait, crocodilians are definitely on four legs and they're, you know, very different looking. We know that that is a derived attribute of that crocodile lineage, that ones that were very early in that group are bipedal, are very active, long legged creatures in general. So some of them are quadrupeds as well. So what we do know also is that these filamentous structures are widespread and maybe even ancestral to the 
to a group that includes living dinosaurs and pterosaurs. So that really changes. It doesn't mean that they were all fuzzy, but it means that there were likely bristles or filaments on some portion of the body and many dinosaur species. There are several groups of dinosaurs, particularly uh, sauropods and one other group of Ornithischian in which no filaments are known, but that's actually now kind of a rarity. Um, so, but for a context on the evolution of feathers, we know that they predate the evolution of flight. What might they have been used for? Well, we definitely see evidence in the coloration of these patterns that it is more consistent with visual communication rather than with um, crypsis or camouflage. So that these are, are used in, in visual communication, likely before the evolution of flight or coincident with it. You can have multiple functions. All righty. So what, now we get to the other part of the dinosaur um, world that I'm, I'm kind of more fascinated with. And a lot of this work is on living birds. But we come to this question, what di might dinosaurs have sounded like? And I often get asked, did they quack like a duck? Did they tweet like a songbird? Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that today. So <clears throat> in our imagination, dinosaurs sound like this. And you can see exactly what I'm talking about with the spines that are on the back. They've modeled this very much like the earliest reconstructions of a dinosaur. But if I asked any of you, and we were in a hall together, what that animal sounds like, I'll play it again. As it's about to eat these children, it sounds like a lion. And that's not really a coincidence because I think we put the voices of large terrestrial carnivores into the voices of large extinct carnivores, even though they're not closely related. So when we think about what science tells us about what extinct dinosaurs sounded like, we need to first look at our closest cousins of dinosaurs and at our living dinosaurs. So here are the sounds of extant crocodilians. And in fact, I want you to remember that second noise. So these are sounds made by extant um, crocodilians. That includes uh, allig alligators and crocodiles, that, that group, crocodilia. And what we hear is this first sound is pretty scary. But this is a closed mouth sound. So in fact, all of the sounds made by living crocodilians are made with the mouth closed. And remember that one for a second. Julia, Julia. We're, ha we're having trouble hearing the hearing the sound. Oh, you're not hearing any sound? Well, yeah, it might, it might be that it's not sharing to us. Oh, I needed to click share original sound. You know what? I'll just describe it to you. There's only one more slide with sound. So that, well, we'll skip the, we'll skip the sound. How's that? Or do you want the sound? I can reshare my screen. Um, go, you can go ahead and re, uh, reshare your screen. Okie dokie. You guys can be typing question, any questions you have. Um, oh boy. <clears throat> you know what? Um, I think that my, I think I'm gonna keep going and I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna, you're gonna get the uh, live dramatic reenactment. That sounds great. So that's great. I, I just played a sound for you that went like, right? But it was made with the mouth completely closed. And another sound, and you can Google sounds of crocodilians. This was gonna show you that in fact, we know that living birds um, also produce mouth sounds with the mouth closed. And we did a study of this actually, um, the evolution of this trait within reptiles, including living birds. So if you want to Google something fun, listen to an ostrich boom call. That's what I would be playing for you right now. And an ostrich boom call is made with the mouth closed as well. So this is not widespread, particularly it's not common in songbirds, but it is, is quite common in um, large bodied basal groups of birds. And it characterizes other clades. So all coos of doves are made with the mouth closed. 
And I may blow your mind, or you may already know this, but there are no specialized air sacs that are used in making these sounds. This is the esophagus of the bird that is inflated. Then the mouth is closed and the syrinx produces the sound and resonates it into the mouth cavity and into the esophagus. So those pictures, sage grouse, doves, those pictures at the bottom, those are all incidences of blowing up the esophagus and then res using that to resonate sound. And so um, kind of changes your view of what these birds are doing, I think. Well, what we found is that in fact, there was about little better than 50% probability that this behavior would characterize dinosaurs, extinct dinosaurs. And that doesn't mean that they all had it. It doesn't mean that um, it, they didn't. It, what it means is that, in fact, uh, we think this would have been likely in many species of extinct dinosaurs. And it also would differentially characterize larger bodied species. So in living birds, this way of shaping sound is, um, is associated with increases in body size in living birds. So that's kind of what we're using to think about the whether sounds in extinct dinosaurs would have been differentially closed or open mouth sounds. So picture that T-Rex attacking you, and if it's vocalizing, perhaps the mouth is closed. And as I'll come to, it's unlikely that a T-Rex would be vocalizing as it's about to eat you. So this is a reconstruction in the lower left of potentially, these are two reconstructions of closed mouth um, vocalization in extinct dinosaurs. So we come to another question, and that is about sound producers. So not shaping the sound by having the mouth open or closed, but what is producing the sound. And I would have a clip here from Jurassic Park about where they explain to you they've reconstructed the vocal, uh, the vocal organ of a velociraptor. But I'm going to skip that, and I'm going to move on to what we know about sound making. So. In our closest cousins of dinosaurs and living birds, those are our crocodilians, they vocalize using the larynx. And up here, if I click on this, you're going to see kind of a stake of uh, the back part of, of a crocodilian and alligator skull. And it's going to spin around and it's going to reveal, with no sound, um, the, the vocal organ of a crocodilian that's seated kind of in the tongue elements and the muscles that attach to it. And crocodilians relative to other reptiles are more vocal. The babies start pipping um, when they are in the egg, similar to living birds, and juvenile crocodilians and adults, the juveniles communicate with the adults. So I'll come back to you. All of that is using the larynx. In living birds, you have a sound source that's situated, the sound maker. Unlike me, I'm using a larynx like this crocodilian to produce sound here. But in living birds, the sound maker is situated right next to the heart. So I like to say birds, you can think of birds singing from the heart. So we often look at a bird and we see the tongue apparatus moving, but that's not making the sound. The sound is produced deep in the chest, right next to the, you know, right above the lungs. And that's the spinning thing showing the muscles that are around the syrinx or the vocal organ of birds. So it's really quite extraordinary and why we've been so interested to study this is that if you look at all of these groups that I've shown in this picture, all of them vocalize using the larynx with the exception of birds. Why did birds evolve a completely new vocal organ when the, the vocal organ that's ancestral has been adapted to all of these different forms? Um, you know, echolocation calls in bats, whale calls. Those are all things that are made with the larynx. Why did birds evolve a completely new vocal organ? Well, I can, spoiler alert, tell you we don't have the complete answer to that question, but that's why this research is ongoing. So the question has been, when does a syrinx evolve within dinosaurs? We don't know, we know it's not in crocodilians, we know it's in all living birds, when does that arise? Well, if we look at, at how, um, how, where I started with this investigation of sound making, and I'm gonna kind of walk you through what we know and a major discovery I made that kind of led to a whole new research area. 
So in when I started work, people talked about dinosaur vocalizations and even the Jurassic Park movies. They focused on what are resonating chambers in one group of dinosaurs that's actually distantly related, comparatively distantly related to birds, a distant cousin. And they have these hollow tubes in the skull that connect to the nares or the nose holes. But that is a resonating feature, rather like the esophagus functions in a dove. It's not a feature, it's a feature that shapes sound rather than producing it. So there wasn't any insight into what was a dinosaur using to make sound. And my own observations started with looking at fossils of relatives of living bird species and things that were uh, other dinosaurs that, that branched off before the origin of living birds. So on the left side, you see fossils of living bird species. These are related to living bird species. So the top right is something that top left is, is something related to parrots and songbirds. We have a moa, we have an ostrich, and another re relative of a parrot um, down there at the bottom. And all of these fossils preserved tracheal rings. These are um, mineralized rings that, um, sh that hold up the airway that support the airway going down to the lungs and i never saw these features in in these dinosaurs on the right or any of other dinosaurs that i had looked at so that got me thinking about things and then that ultimately led to the discovery of the oldest known fossil evidence of the avian vocal organ and that's shown a reconstruction of it in the middle relative to the syrinx of a duck and the airway of a crocodilian in this picture. So how did I get there? Well, this fossil is from Antarctica and it's from a relative of a living duck or duck or geese. It just happens to be about 68 to 66 million years old. So it's older than the, um, the end of all of the other eight dinosaurs. This is our field site in Antarctica. I think it's gorgeous. It's very windy. Um, it's on Vega Island, and there were two fossils discovered on this island actually in 1992. And the first one I was asked to work on in the late 1990s, and I published that in 2005. And that was the earliest evidence of living bird, li you know, uh, of, a, of a skeleton of a relative of living birds prior to the extinction of non avian dinosaurs, of the other dinosaurs. But another fossil was collected at the same time. And many years later, I was asked to work on that fossil, which turned out to be from the same species. And I was working on this fossil that had actually been in my office in Austin for a little too long. And I was returning it to Argentina where it was housed because many countries work in Antarctica in the same sites. So I was looking at this fossil and there was one little tiny bony element that I couldn't identify. And I could have just assumed it was a toe bone, but I was like, what is that thing? And what's shown on the outside are CT scans of the fossil and then the fossil itself. So I didn't know what this was. So we got the CT scans and that's when it appeared. And I, I kind of lost my mind a little bit because I had been thinking about this question of what fossil evidence of the avian vocal organ would look like, and here it was. So there was actually a three-dimensionally preserved, um, the part, the rings that support the vibrating um, vocal folds that produce sound in birds. And it was three-dimensionally preserved. So you can see where, um, where it says LTM, that's where the membranes would be supported that would be vibrating and producing sound. This is a reconstruction of it, um, but actually most of it was intact. So you can see that the lighter gray color was intact and just the only reassembled portion are the gray rings. Well, in fact, there's been a lot of studies of the avian syrinx, but most of them were done a really long time ago. And most of the illustrations of the avian, these are all different bird vocal organs. And they're going to, I mean, you lo start looking at these and they can just blow your mind. The upper left one is, is a, an, a relative, of, it's a duck um, that is in the upper left. So they have crazy vocal organs. So there were all these pictures that were used in figuring out different um, major groups of birds. 
but they weren't, you know, they were figuring out the, the evolutionary relationships among living birds, but they were incomplete. And they also hadn't been scrutinized in many cases for many years. As you might be aware, most of the research on avian sound making has been on one model species, the zebra finch. And it's been a model species because it's a song learner, which is actually um, derived, it, it evolves three times in living birds, in hummingbirds, in parrots, and in, in songbirds or ossines, um, at least three times because it also evolves in sub sub -ossines. But this trait was of great interest. But it turns out the vocal organs that are illustrated in most ornithology texts like this one, they show a songbird syrinx. And it's not the characteristic of, of what the ancestral syrinx for living birds would have been like. So we had to look at syrinxes from a lot more um, uh, species that diverged a lot closer to the, the starting point of the, the living bird tree, like chickens. I just love this illustration of a chicken. So what we had to do to compare to the fossil was generate the first 3D data on the avian vocal organ um, from uh, many different species of living birds. So there had been one study that looked at the 3D structure of the vocal organ in, a, in the zebra finch, but nothing on any other of these birds. So we were able to, for the first time, to estimate the characteristics of the the ancestral vocal organ in living birds and place the fossils based on all of the evidence, the other bony evidence, as um, a relative of living ducks and geese. So I like to show that if this is a complicated figure, but if you look down here where it says origin of the syrinx and dinosauria, that would be kind of like the Model T or the earliest version of the thing. And what we found in the fossil record from the age of dinosaurs was more like the Chevy Impala. This is a, it is in, in many ways similar to living bird syrinxes, and it's, it's from a group of living that still has living descendants today. So we were gaining insight by looking at ostrich syrinxes and tinamus and other things to, to, into what those characteristics are of the structure of the avian vocal organ. Because the syrinx, and I, if you wanna know, I can tell you about the origin of the term syrinx, it literally means bird vocal organ as it is used today. It comes from, an, um, it's a fun story, but uh, it doesn't have a kind of functional uh, structural description. So a larynx, by contrast, the thing that I'm using to talk to you with, that larynx is a modified valve that, that originally kept material from going down into the airway. And it sits at the end of my airway. Whereas the syrinx is situated where the airway branches to go to the lungs in living birds. And if you're asking what the, the other fossil that's in pink, that was um, the, another fossil syrinx from 50 million years ago that we, uh, that we described for the first time. It's also a relative of living ducks and geese. So what do we know, what are we learning about dinosaur sound making? Well, we think that both closed and open mouth vocalization is likely. Um, and I would encourage you to kind of just look at living dinosaurs, your birds, with new eyes. Because then when you're sitting on Lamar and you're looking at the, you're waiting for the light to change, just think, wow, that pigeon is blowing up its esophagus and using it to resonate and shape sound in low frequencies. That's pretty amazing. And then you can think, well, given that all crocodilian sounds are made with the mouth closed, it, you know, what we have is potentially evidence in a lot of basal birds produce sound in a similar way. Hmm, maybe my favorite dino extinct dinosaur does that too. So the earliest known fossilized evidence of a vocal organ like living birds is still known from a species related to the living species we have today. That's, it's, it's a part of, of the lineage and Seriformes. So what, what, um, 
that means is that we still haven't found earlier evidence of that. And I'm, believe me, I've been looking. I'm not going to go into hypotheses for the origin of the syrinx. This is still something that we're actively working on right now. But I'm going to go back to our questions about like what else do we need to know to look into this. So it's it's good to remember that bird song and bird sound making is a function of of the brain of the respiratory system that has to generate air pressure behind the vocal organs and the vocal organ itself. So we want, when we think about dinosaurs and how this whole picture evolved, we have to think about all of those systems. And what I'll tell you just today is that in say T-Rex, for example, the brain is very different from a living bird brain. In fact, it's much more crocodilian in aspect. Um, and what we see is we get closer to living birds. You have a living bird at the bottom and then you have a, a raptor dinosaur at the top is expansion of the forebrain. But even with that expanded forebrain, that doesn't characterize just, just species of birds that um, learn song, that characterizes um, all birds relative to extinct dinosaurs. They have this bigger forebrain um, that is that is novel. Um, but if we think about T-Rex, what I can tell you is that it didn't say Polly wants a cracker. Vocal learning, um, the ability to learn sounds is derived in these three lineages I mentioned, uh, at least three lineages. So in songbirds, <clears throat> multiple times maybe, parrots and hummingbirds. So no Polly wants a cracker. So wrapping it up, when do dinosaurs make sounds? Well, you guys, I presume many of you actively watch dinosaurs in the field. And I think you would be better suited to advise on a Jurassic World film than whoever is doing that advising. Because what we often see is vocalization reconstructed in contexts where I think it would be uncommon. So for example, you know, I don't know about this training your, your dinosaur scene particularly, but these were extremely vocal animals in this scene. And I'm presuming that is indicating some soci inferred social behavior in these dinosaurs, um, who knows? As I said, there are other aspects of the brain that we have to think about in these dinosaurs as well. But one thing I can tell you is that as I said before, communication between the juveniles and the adults and, a become, and a, between adults of the same species is a very important in both groups of living, um, either the close relatives of dinosaurs and crocodilians or living dinosaurs. So crocodilians do start vocalizing very, very early. This is not something we see in other reptiles. So um, where there is vocal behavior, we're learning that is increasingly, um, is more prevalent than we thought in things like turtles, but it is not in these contexts that are shared here between these living groups. Display behaviors and, uh, and vocal signaling with risk, um, in the context of territorial maintenance or in attraction of a mate these are things that occur in both the cousins of dinosaurs and living dinosaurs today. So these are important contexts in which sounds would have been made. It's unlikely that a, a large a carnivorous dinosaur would vocalize and then eat a small child because vocalizations for the most part are made on the exhale. So if you imagine making a really loud yell and then trying to eat a cheeseburger, you might have a bit of a problem, even if you can effectively breathe through your nose. So these are not contexts where it is, it is particularly common to, to vocalize right before uh, eating a giant prey item. So I like to say that if we re-envisioned Jurassic Park and the sounds that were made, it would probably be a little bit more like a rom-com. So I hope I've taken you today from these really old fashioned views of dinosaurs that have very little to do that, that, you know, you think about dinosaurs and you don't even think of them in the same thought as living birds to kind of meshing our understanding of dinosaurs in our understanding of living birds. And as I said, my work 
has been to try to make sense of extinct life in deep time, millions and millions of years. But I've ended up gaining new insight into living, uh, living birds by trying to ask those new questions. And I like to conclude with this illustration of um, Alfred Hitchcock, the birds, because I like to remind us that we have these large brained vocal learning intelligent species all around us. And it's just our notion of what intelligence looks like that has probably kept us from understanding how amazing they are until comparatively recently. So, um, so with that, I hope you've learned something new about living dinosaurs, about birds, and I wanna thank you for your time today and answer any questions. Hi, Julia, it's Kaylee. I'm back and I've been monitoring the chat for questions. So, okay. um, and there are a few of them. So I'll get started. Uh, first question is, are there any records of iridescent feathers that link to grackles? Uh -huh. So um, not grackles specifically. So the first iridescent feather we actually found, fossilized iridescent feather we found was from the Eocene. So it's about 50 million years. It was not, it was from a relative of a living bird lineage, but because it was an isolated feather, we couldn't um, tell what species it belonged to, um, but it did show that iridescence as well. So, so, I'm gonna tell you that we based our reconstruction of Microraptor on our, my influential grackles around Austin, because what they have is actually a, a low grade iridescence. It's not a highly structured iridescence like you see in like a shiny pheasant or, or duck. Um, and we don't know precisely because we don't have all of the other parts of the feather preserved in the fossil record, we can't tell those details but I was heavily influenced by our grackle friends. That's awesome. So. Um, did the feathered dinosaurs also have large eyes like birds? Yeah, interesting question. Um, so <clears throat> it, it's kind of gradual. So if you go like the, the guys that I showed like Kai Hong Juji, the rainbow dinosaur and those guys, the orbit's fairly small. Um, you still have a pretty long kind of massive, rather comparatively massive skull with teeth in it, you know, and, but I, the orbit, I think kind of gradually gets bigger. I mean, the orbit is what surrounds and supports the eyeball. Um, but I don't, you know, there, there are studies of this and also inference of potential nocturnality in some of these feathered dinosaurs. Um, but I don't think it's like a systematic increase in eye size towards living birds. Um, it's more variable. Generally speaking, species babies have proportionally larger eyes than, than adults. And there are some hypotheses that the skulls become more baby-like or juvenile-like um, in, in close to the transition to living birds. That's one, one hypothesis. So I um, hope that helps. Yeah, that's interesting. I can't um, see the questions, but yeah. That's okay. Yeah, I've, I've been making a list of them. So um, the next one is, why do dinosaur fossils that appear uh, to be most related to modern birds seem to be found or concentrated um, in and around China? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so what we found was, it actually comes back to some of the geoscience aspects to some degree, because the tectonic regime across actually a whole bunch of northern China was a little bit like our basin and range. There was extensional um, movement, rapid deepening of lakes, uh, stuff we have going on in the U in the north in North America, probably closer to 50 million, 40 million years ago, was happening at the right time to capture different kinds of animals in the sediments that were accumulating in those lakes. So it's not that they were differentially like living in China during that time. It's just where we have found rock deposits that have the right properties to preserve animals in that kind of detail. And it's not the only place. So we have Archaeopteryx, which is a feathered dinosaur that we think had active flight 
what some people call the first bird. I think that's a transition that's gradual. So, um, but that's from Germany in the Solnhofen kind of near shore marine setting of Europe. There are other birds and feathers known from Spain because Europe's an archipelago during um, parts of the Cretaceous, early Cretaceous. And so you have a lot of near shore deposits where you can get um, this kind of very detailed preservation. You also, there's sites uh, um, in all different places, but the conditions for the preservation of soft tissues are not like super duper common, but they can occur on any continent. It's not like limited by geography, but right. it is limited by what the geologic conditions were during the time in that location. Is that a good place to, to preserve a fossil? Um, it's a great question. Yeah, um, totally makes sense. Um, do you have any ideas about how leg feathers were used? Yeah, they're confusing. Um, I think close to the origin of flapping flight. So we have what we can look at in living birds and call flight. But you got to understand, like the earliest form of movement in air is, is not going to be what we have outside our windows because natural selection has been acting to kind of hone, if you will, the apparatus used in flight for like uh, since 160 million years ago, 160 million years. And if the living, you know, origin of living birds is say around 70 million years, that's a long time to accumulate change. So what we see is probably a variety of ways of moving um, using, I believe, both the legs and the forearms. Um, and it doesn't mean they were flapping the hind limb. I don't really believe that is true given the position of those feathers. Were they acting as an accessory airfoil during flapping movements? Um, sure, I think potentially so. There's a bunch of different studies of this, and but we think this is an independent, where those leg feathers get really long, kind of wing-like, that's not the closest relative of, of, our, of what we call active flyers. We think it's maybe its own thing. It's its own, it took like short leg feathers that kind of look like a cowboy ruff or like fringe and then kind of went crazy with it. But that that doesn't characterize everybody. That it's not necessarily an evolutionary stage that everything went through on the way to f active flight. But the cowboy fringe is definitely around. Could, and, and what we know in at least one dinosaur I worked on is it's spotted and spangled and probably kind of like an ornament. Hmm. So the long ones definitely are probably used in some kind of accessory airfoil. That means to generate lift and, and be somehow airborne. Um, so hmm. hopefully that's some, something useful. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and what is the earliest group of birds? Yeah, so this comes down to the definition of bird. So for example, this is a classic thing. Um, what, what is the first human? Is it the first bite, just to use that as an example, is the first human everything after our split from chimps? Or is the first human the first thing after our split from chimps that's bipedal? Or is it the first thing after a split from chimps that, that used tools or used fire or made art or, and it's, it's a naming thing. So we tend to use the word bird for active flapping flyers. So what we do is operationally, if it flapped and was airborne and it's a dinosaur, we want to call it a bird. So for me, that's everything Archaeopteryx and closer to birds. And that would be around 150 million years ago, the earliest bird. But I think this notion of what's a bird and what's not a bird kind of, it gets real messy when you got things with airfoils on their legs that are probably independent, is that that's not a bird, right? And then you got things with short wings that maybe are using what's called uh, like an escape behavior that involves flapping the wings, but they're not fully airborne. So most people wouldn't call that a bird, but that kind of sets up some artificial break where 
suddenly boom they're a bird and it's maybe not in real life it's not a huge transition it's it's a gradual transition with a new way of moving that is exaggerated and and becomes flapping flight that's a short version yeah yeah i th i think the the comparison to to humans was was a good example it kind of it really comes down to like how you define a bird so um let's see the next question is are there birds that don't have syrinxes and if so why not oh fun question we're working on them too the only group of birds that is not known not reported to have a syrinx are vultures so that's only new world vultures and that's only going to be like your black vulture and your turkey vulture and it's super cool i've looked at their where the syrinx should be and there is nothing but it doesn't mean it looks like a crocodilian it's like uh they've lost the vocal fold to from what we can see and what has been reported they have lost vocal folds in the syrinx hmm. Spoiler alert, that might not be the whole story, but we're, we're still figuring that one out. But isn't that cool? You can go look at a black vulture and say, wow, I have one of the only representatives of a bird that lacks a syrinx in my yard. That is so cool. So hopefully that adds <laughs> to your birding enjoyment. Yes, just another reason to appreciate vultures. Oh my God, I love them. Great. <laughs> Me too. Um, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but... Um, is display one of the functions of dino feathers? Yes. Yes, because what we, so I didn't show a picture of this dinosaur, but with iridescence, it's definitely not for hiding. And it's not, uh, you know, you can have bright colors functioning in Crypsis if you're living in a brightly colored environment. But in when there's been studies of living birds, that looked at large color patches versus small color patches that break up the body outline. And there's another dinosaur I didn't show a picture of that has these very large white color patches on the body. Um, again, associated not as much with breaking up the body outline, but with visual communication. Rather, I like to think of it a little bit like our, our, mock, our mocking birds when they flash their their wings. There's people think that functions potentially in multiple ways, and it can. Things can have multiple functions. So, um, but yes, we do think that communication is is a, a core, a key function in these early feathers. Visual communication, yeah, yeah. Awesome. I think um, the last question that we'll um, cover is, do you know the date for the origin of waterfowl versus the origin of songbirds? Yeah. So it's going to be, you know, somewhat debated, but you're asking me. Um, and the, rel the age for the lineage that includes all of your living waterfowl is going to be closer to like 70 million. So, but in the age of dinosaurs, mm -hmm. that lineage actually has some really crazy species, like um, ones that evolve fake teeth and all and get reached enormous sizes, and then also giant uh, flightless birds that are also part of that lineage. Um, so they've been around a long time. Songbirds, you're getting to maybe uh, about thirty million, so it's about half the age. And there's some people that think the earliest part of songbirds, you know, maybe goes into the Eocene, so maybe 50 million, but they're they're younger. Um, yeah, it actually makes songbirds all the more remarkable because they are half of the living species richness in birds are songbirds, and they evolved in a very short evolutionary yeah. period, which is really quite amazing if you think about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, we're, we're out of time, but oh, let me uh, mention the book. I shouldn't, I should mention this. I have yeah. a book. I have two chapters in a book called what is a bird. It, I can say it's a gorgeously illustrated book. I have a whole chapter on all the weirdness with feathers and body ornaments on birds. And that was super fun to write. It's out on Princeton university press. 
And then a colleague of mine, um, Jonathan Myberg, who actually has a UT in Austin connection, has a book coming out on Caracaras this spring. And you guys might want to have him come. I don't know if he's already coming to talk to you about that, but it's called A Most Remarkable Bird, and it comes out in March. So I met him through our bird club in Austin. So local bird authors you can find, and I should have had slides to show that, but I hope you'll... And he has an event at Book People in March. Oh, nice. Yes. So oh, I think uh, the 30th of March. So you can hear, I'm, I'm actually in his book. He came with us to Chile and um, there were a bunch of caracaras in our field site where we were looking for extinct dinosaurs. So it's a funny connection. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you so much, Julia, for um, rescheduling with us. And, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about living birds, but um, this, this was a really cool look at their ancestors. So we really, really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. It was such a pleasure speaking with you. And I hope I run into you, some of you guys uh, birding in Austin. And uh, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks okay. everyone for coming. Take care. Bye. Bye.